joining us online at a later time. I'm going to open up the announcements with a great big thank you. That hot luck last week was quite amazing. I think it's the first one that I haven't either, I don't know, worked in the kitchen before or cooked or cleaned. I did nothing but eat. <laughs> so it was a real treat. So thank you because it takes the whole church to put something like that together. Uh, to get it all organized and going. So thank you, thank you, and thank you too to the quilters. There's a little card unlocked in your room, but um, thank you, that was an amazing gift, and I've been sleeping under it, it's quite comfortable. <laughs> um, service tonight is 7.30, so 7.30 this evening. So I know there are a couple of other announcements. Susan's made, 
Um, if you're interested in bringing it to sort of place the turning off the sheets so we know how many we have and don't get too many. Thank you. And then I also would like to welcome Sarah Steves to our service today. She's um, gracing us with her, her talents. <laughs> the sky was brighter than usual that night, making it easier to keep track of the sheep. And then it got really bright. You would have thought that all that glory shining would have been a sign. That's what most of us look for. Great, big, obvious clues about God's presence. But instead, the angel says that a baby, a newborn, helpless baby in a feeding trough was it. God's sign that more love is possible.
coming together. Surely the Lord is in this place. And I am not aware of it. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So we'll have our little echo prayer and then get into the children's time, speaking of Advent, talking of hope, peace, joy, and today love. So, dear Lord, our ears are open. Dear Lord, our ears are open. To hear the angels sing. To hear the angels sing. Our hearts and minds are open. Our hearts and minds are open. To the message that they bring. To the message that they bring. Amen. So, our angel, our sign of angels this season has been feathers. Be very careful. And today the feather is going to write. None of us use feathers anymore to dip into ink and write. But we've all seen it in a movie or know that that used to be a writing instrument. And there are lots and lots of good reasons to write letters. You can write to say thank you, or happy birthday, or Merry Christmas, get well. But all the messages in those letters are all the same. Because they're all <coughs> an expression of love. When you write a Christmas card or a birthday card or get well, you're expressing love and concern for someone. So I encourage you to take time to maybe not pull out a feather and write, but we can phone, we can text, we can email, and we can actually write a note and still mail it, just to show someone that you love them. And many of us will know this as a Christmas carol, it's, it's a poem, Love Came Down at Christmas. Love came down at Christmas. Love, all lovely, love divine. Love was born at Christmas, star and angel gave the sign. Worship me the Godhead, love incarnate, love divine. Worship we our Jesus, but wherewith for sacred sign. Love shall be your token, love shall be yours, and love be mine. Love to God and neighbor, love for plea and gift and sign. Anyway, so let's have a little prayer. Thank you, God, for your message of love. Give us wings to share your message with the whole world. Amen.
As soon as the heavenly messengers disappeared into heaven, the shepherds were buzzing with conversation.
Today, in the city of David, a Savior has been born, who is the Messiah. This will be a sign that I am speaking truly. You will find a baby wrapped in bands of cloth, lying in a manger. Then other angels appeared, countless in number, singing praises to God. Uncle Hosea looked strange. His eyes were focused trans-like on the far horizon. He shook his head up and down, saying, Yes, yes, we must go to Bethlehem. My brothers, cousins, and I couldn't believe how weird our fathers were acting. But we were too stunned to ask any more questions. For the first time in ever, we left the sheep alone. I worried whether they would be alive when we returned. Quickly, I petted Bella, my favorite, and told him to be careful. The 12-mile journey to Bethlehem passed quickly. My father and uncle practically ran the whole way. It was all my brothers, cousins, and I could do to keep up with them. Strangely, I don't remember feeling cold, even though I could see my breath. Nor do I remember anyone saying anything during our journey. A single thought kept repeating in my mind. Tomorrow, these two drunken shepherds will be sorry they made us leave the sheep alone. On the way to Bethlehem, I thought what my father claimed he saw. I kept asking myself, why? Why would angels of the Lord bother with lowly shepherds? We weren't wealthy. We weren't powerful. There weren't many jobs worse than shepherding. We were treated like outcasts by almost everyone. Because we couldn't leave the sheep alone, we weren't able to attend the religious festivals or make regular offerings at the temple. The priests called us unclean and looked down on us for not following all their silly rules. My brothers and I couldn't attend the temple school. She couldn't be left alone, except for tonight. It was still dark when we got to Bethlehem. My heart sank as I saw thousands of families encamped there for the census. I had heard about the emperor's order that everyone was to be counted. That probably meant new taxes. The Romans never lowered taxes. Shepherds generally ignored these decrees. Our moving around in the countryside made it impossible for tax collectors to find us. My father began asking anyone we met, do you know where the Savior has been born? One man said something crude, while another laughed like my father had made a hilarious joke. I was beginning to question my father's sanity. He had had plenty of time to sober up. Then my uncle said to my father, Malachi, remember the words of the angel. You will find the Savior in a manger. I wondered if my uncle knew how many stables were in Bethlehem. My father said, Yes, how could I have forgotten? Let's search for a stable. My brother John objected. But there must be many stables in Bethlehem, and it is still night. How could we find the right one? Even though I knew it was crazy, we split into two groups and began to search for a stable with a baby in it. We agreed to meet at the first light of dawn at the inn we passed coming into town. My father, brothers, and I wandered through the streets of Bethlehem like blind men. We listened for noises of animals in the still of the night. These sounds would lead us to the stables. After hours of hunting, we had found seven stables, but no savior. Just before dawn, we found my uncle and cousins waiting for us in front of the inn. They also had found several stables, but none with a baby. I could tell by the look on my father's face that he was beginning to question the angel's words, if there ever was an angel. By now, I was really worried about the sheep we had left alone. I wanted to go home. 
Just as I was about to say that we should return home, I heard a weak moan. Quiet, do you hear that? I asked. In the silence, the noise, the noise became clearer. It was the gentle lowing of a cow coming from behind the inn. We ran around to the back of the inn and found a stable. To my everlasting surprise, a family was in the stable among the animals, and there in the manger was a baby. The cow was lowing because the baby lay on top of the straw she wanted to eat. My father humbly approached the family in the stable, like they were royalty. He told the mother and father about the vision of the angels and how he was told he would find the baby, the savior, wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. The parents looked surprised by my father's story, but not as much as I had expected. Mainly, they seemed tired. They said nothing, but the young mother smiled wearily, slightly turning off the edges of her mouth. She looked like she was thinking about my father's story. While she thought, I craned my neck to catch a glimpse of the baby the angel said was the Messiah. He looked like a newborn lamb, red and wrinkled. He didn't look any different than any other baby. I don't know what I expected. We stayed just a few minutes. There seemed to be nothing more to say. We returned home as quickly as we had come. Even though we had barely slept, the journey home was somehow easier and our steps lighter. Joy was with us. The sun rose higher over the horizon, the beginning of a new day. To greet the morning, my father and uncle began to sing a song of praise to God they had learned as boys. My brothers and cousins joined in singing the familiar tune. Finally, I added my voice to the notes of praise and glory. What else could we do, knowing that the Savior had been born? The message that the sign of God's presence in the world was to be found in a newborn, in a feeding trough, shows us how powerful vulnerability is. <laughs> when God offers God's self in this form, rather than that of might and force, we recognize that love is what will save us if we but, op but open ourselves to each other. And we discover that God does and will use the so-called lowest or marginalized to bring the real message of love into the world. Fear brings one-upmanship. Fear says that I have to be better than you to feel worthy. Fear says that I must use power in all the stereotypical ways in order to gain the approval I need. The angel says, do not be afraid, and shows us how everyone matters by giving the message first to the shepherds. Shepherds were despised. They were seen to be dishonest people who let their sheep eat the grass on other people's land. True power and the possibility of loving deeply comes with simply being open and vulnerable and being truly yourself. God can work with that. The angel role here is that of storyteller. They declare what has happened. The scripture proceeds then to confirm through the shepherd's own eyes that what the angels have declared is true. As a result of having heard and seen these things, the shepherds themselves become messengers as they return, praising God, mirroring the songs of the angel multitude. What acts of love have we witnessed in our lives that can tell 
us to proclaim that love wins. What acts of love have you witnessed in your life that compels you to proclaim that love wins? How can you this week be God's messenger, angels among us, and share God's love with another?
flying with their luggage. We pray for our family gatherings that they be times of joy. <coughs> we thank you to all who extend invitations to family and friends to join them to celebrate the season. Make us one with your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And then I'll invite the chime fire forward.
so with joy, let us present our offerings of commitment and support for the work of this church. There's a little bowl in the back if you have a hard copy. Thank you for those who give online or using pre-authorized readings.
and remember the message that we must take into the world. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I invite you to pass the love of Christ with your neighbors. For each time you connect with one another, love grows. I'm <laughs> <laughs>